As I was mentioning at the beginning, before the screening of the film, uh, Papi Corsicato is in New York uh, for the Tribeca Film Festival, where he's presenting his latest work, and it's a documentary film on Julian Schnabel. Yes. A personal portrait, is that the...? Uh, private por a private, private portrait. A private portrait. <laughs> uh, let's start with the last one, and then we'll go in retrospect. You mean with uh, Julian? With Julian, yes. Well, uh, but, um, okay, what shall we say? Because it's the one that is... Uh, sure. At, at okay, now, I'm telling you, okay, <laughs> the 5th of May, which would be uh, next week, Yes. it would come out at Quote Cinema. Please, if you have time, go see it, okay? It's <laughs> one block from here. It's a one block from here. Uh, do and you know that the Quote Cinema was the first uh, multi-theater uh, uh, in the US, and it reopened after several years yes. of... And so no, we are very fortunate, it's just next door. Yeah. Yes, and now the thing, the nice thing is that the distributor of this documentary, he bought the cinema and he renewed and he made a very beautiful cinema. I went by the other day, I stopped by, and it's very beautiful. Uh, he made a very comfortable and nice cinema. Because I think it was closed for a while. Yes, yeah, several yeah. years. So, yeah. So, and so I'm very pleased that he's going to show the documentary there. Also at Plaza Saint, uh, Lincoln Saint. But, um, but here is more like a, a Cartier, whatever, you know. Cinema. It's a jewelry. Yes, yes. And um, Papi, you, you have known uh, Julian Schnabel for quite a long time. Yes. Personally, and that's, I yes. believe, where the private portrait comes <laughs> in. And uh, who had the idea? Did you propose to Julian? I to proposed to him. I, I knew Julian when I used to live here in the in the New York in the 80s. Of course, I knew him as a, you know, one of the best uh, artists, uh, you know, in the American scene. And but I didn't know him personally. Then much later in 2000, I met him in Naples because he came for a show that a friend of mine had, and um, so we got. We bounded that we became, some, I mean, friends, and since then we've been seeing each other, and uh, so I, I got a chance to know him very well. I have to say that he also made some movies that, from my point of view, uh, at least two of these movies are two masterpieces, and um, which are Before Night Falls and The Diving Bell and The Butterfly. I don't know if you, it, it saw it, see it, if you saw it, but they're very beautiful. So, and that really, for me, when I met him, for me, it was a big thrill because I, uh, as I say, I love this movie very much. And um, so then, 2013, I went to visit him because he comes very frequently in Italy. And he, he went to the Galli Island, which is a beautiful island on the uh, Amalfi Coast. Very beautiful place. Is where Rudolf Nureyev had his yes, villa? Yes, no, first uh, Vasily, I mean, first yeah. the, the Russian choreographer from the Russian company, then Nureyev after, and then uh, some Italian guy from Sorrento bought the island, and it became kind of resort. Anyway, so Julian went there. I went to visit him and said, Julian, why don't you make a documentary on you? Because, you know, Julian, I don't know if you know him. I don't know if... if Talking about with that really scene is makes sense. But I don't want to bother you. Say so what is talking have the about? We have the trailer, okay. Papi. I think we should run the trailer. Okay, let's run the trailer first. Yeah. the trailer first. Okay. Everything has a story. Everything comes from somewhere, and he takes his world and he reorders it. There was no confusion at all about what he was meant to do with his life. He's always said to me, making art is an exit out of reality. And basically, it will save you from everything. When you're young, you have a desire to do something, and you don't know what it is, but you're propelled to do it. Painting was his life. 
It was his joy. When he was a child, he was always drawing something. He really had talent. Julian's life started to explode. In the 80s, Julian had tremendous success in New York City. He was a big sensation in the art world. I had the privilege of being around some people that really had a vision, and they shared some of that with me. He moves very easily between worlds of film and worlds of painting. He would have absorbed the movie with such vitality and love, really. How is my father on the set? It was incredible. I couldn't believe that he was able to do this and paint. I mean, I knew he wasn't like everybody else's parents, but to me, it wasn't shocking. You have to have this infinite belief in whatever you're doing that is not rational. It's blind faith. So uh, today you just came from a Tribeca Film Festival. Yes. You had a screening and the Q&A after the film. Um, yeah. And there, are there more shows? Tomorrow. At the Tomorrow in the afternoon, yes. And then from the 5th, it's going to be at the Quad and Lincoln Plaza. Yes. And I think we shouldn't say anything more about <laughs> Schnabel because no. it's in theaters. It's not a thriller, but it's a film. And we don't want to spoil it for the no. people who are going to see it. But this connects me to the next step. Um, in this last part of your career, um, you have really concentrated on contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, we have seen at least three or four of your films during um, an evening that we dedicated to the um, um, Arte Cinema, the festival that takes place in Naples and that celebrates this ideal marriage between cinema and contemporary art. So it seems that it's your, your, the thing that it, it's more important to you, more relevant to you right now, uh, to bring together cinema, that is your medium of expression, and contemporary art. From what I understand, and only from the trailer, because I've not seen the mm -hmm. film, this seems like a, sort of a more traditional documentary in the sense yes. that it, there are the interviews yes. and there is the footage from, from the past. Yeah. Whereas my impression when I saw your other works, uh, the ones we presented, the ones that are on your website, is that you create films about art that are, per se, works of art. Your films about uh, Mimo Palladino, mm -hmm. it is a, a form of video art in which you show the works of the mm -hmm. artist, but at the same time, it's the medium itself, the cinema that becomes mm -hmm. art. Um, why this choice for different choice for Schnabel compared to the other? And how many are they, the one on contemporary art? Something like 20 or more than that, right? It's almost 30 something, yeah. I, th I think. Now, the, the difference is that when I, when I have to work on installation, uh, I, have to, I have to find a story to, to tell about this installation, which means just maybe put an element, like let's say in Richard Serra, a, a spiral, Spiral. Spiral, sorry. <laughs> I put um, a, an ape inside, and uh, it was like telling a story and, 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 and show this um, installation through this ape eyes. So I always try to make a story, even though it's a maybe conceptual story or maybe it's an abstract story, but I try to make a story. With Julian, I had the story, of course. So it was just the opposite. But through his story, I also told something about me. In fact, when I say a private portrait, I would say in the end, it's more my private portrait through his portrait. You know what I'm saying? Yes. There are some connection about his life, about his relationship with the, his parents, the way he sees uh, art that I'm very connected with, and also I appreciate it. So, so, I, so that's why it's apparently more, let's say, conventional, more traditional. But, but in the end, still, for me, it's like when I make a movie or when I make an installation, on, you know, movie on installation, because it's always a way to uh, express myself and tell something about me 
or through a story that I think about and transpose in, in some other things story. And Papi, how do you work with the artists that become the subject of your uh, films about art? Do you talk with them before about the concept that you are uh, thinking of using? Do you ask for their advice? Do you, you don't tell them anything? Do you ignore them? Do you engage in a conversation <laughs> no, with them? It depends. If, if I work on installation, I don't have to tell nothing to anyone. So I, the opposite. Sometimes they say, I remember in Italy there was this very famous artist called Mario Merz. He made some installation. He asked me, listen, don't invent anything strange. He didn't know me at all. He said, just, uh, you know, I want to see people in, because this installation was in a square the very famous square in Naples. And he said, you know, I want to see just people, you know, going around, the, the kids play on my installation. I said, yes, yes, yeah, of course, I'll do whatever you please and whatever you like. But then I, I totally closed the, the square. Nobody came in the square, no human being came. And I had a zoo bring me a, an elephant, to camels and, and I, I and I spread those animals in the square, and, uh, and I thought he's gonna kill me. And for sure, he's going to kill me afterwards. But instead, he loved it because there was something connectional about his work that this choice to to put animals was that he connected to his you know work. So he loved it. And when Richard said I saw his work, I said. What, what Mario told you about this, I, 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 I like, he liked it, ah, okay, okay, okay. Then when I did Richard Serra work, I didn't tell him that I would put an ape inside this <laughs> thing and uh, also say it's going to kill me, instead he loved it. But the strange thing was the ape looked alike like uh, Richard Serra. Did you tell him that? <laughs> no, but he was very <laughs> smart about it because when I, I saw with him the, the, the movie and the ape was exactly Richard said, I said, no, what have I done? I, you know, what, what, I was so stupid. And now in the end, he loved it. But he said, you know something? When I was a kid, they used to call me little monkey. So he admitted it. They looked like a monkey. <laughs> so, and, but it was, was fun. He loved it. So, so. so it's basically a dialogue that you entertain from artist yes, to artist. Also, it. because you know why? When you have an installation, once you put your camera here and there, what a bore. I mean, I don't care. I mean, you know, everybody can do that, more or less, I suppose. So it's nice to interact and make like another object out. I mean, it, it is another way to look something else. And, uh, and it works most of the time. I selected one of these uh, yeah. art films, and this is the one um, on the Luigi Ontani work, uh, Maschere Suonanti. So we're going to take a look at it. It's yeah. five, it's okay, five this minutes. Okay, I have to make an. Uh, Something. Please do. It's okay. Rich, okay. Luigi Antani, I don't know if you know him, but he represents himself in his work. Either are masks or statues. He always put himself, and he leaves himself like a, a statue, like a piece of art. So also with him, my interaction is limited because he's already is the, the he's, yeah. yeah. So I don't, I cannot really go over it too much. Okay. Anyway. Enjoy. Maschere suonanti.
you had limited uh, right. capacity of maneuvering because the artist is present and very present in yes. this. Also, also um, the place is a uh, very famous museum, a Sweden museum. In uh, all those white statues was were made by this guy, so it was already lots of stuff going on. So, so there was the original museum, yeah. the installation of Ontani on top of on the top statues of the, yeah. of the museum. So and this one is in Sweden, this museum. No, it's in Rome. A uh, Rome near Piazza del Popolo. It's called uh, Museo Andersen. Andersen. Yeah. And did you do one with Ontani also in Museo di Capodimonte? Yes, I did three with him. One in Capodimonte. One in Bologna also, we went to this house near Bologna. We went like, we very long, one is very long, it's like 40 minutes, 30 minutes. But in this case, he, he basically, the artist acts in the, yeah, in the film. Yeah, with Luigi it's different, yeah, as I say, it's, it's totally in the, is it, is the art, you know, so. And uh, the common thread, I think, of the, your films about art is that there are no words normally, no. <laughs> and, there, and there is the music that plays a, yes. a rather important role. How do you choose the music? Well, it depends. depends. In this case, uh, the, I don't remember the, the truth, but it uh, depends. depends. I don't know. Now, let's say, for instance, the one that we're going to see about Pompeii, si. there was a music, was a, a beautiful requiem from a contemporary uh, musician called the, the, the Rufflet, that I loved it. And since we talk about Pompeii, which was uh, uh, you know, a dead city, you know, was, was killed by the... Um, by Vesuvia. The eruption of Vesuvius, yes. And also we talk about the... the um, how do you say? The calchi, the, the gesso. The cast? The cast of people that came out from the ground, that they, they dig, I don't know how to say now to explain this, the story. So anyway, it was about something that, you know, it was, it was like a requiem on this city that was dead. So I used this composer, and also other composer, but you know, it depends. Sometimes it's just an atmosphere or something that I want to... Let's tell us something more about this video on Pompeii. This is a, a slightly longer, it's about 10 minutes. Yeah. And there is something peculiar that you, uh, came up with the technique um, that after you have done it has appeared in a variety of other I know, but contexts. did I tell you or, or, or you told you, or, or you saw you felt it I mean you you understood no no I saw it and um, I said I've seen other places but after yeah because it. I made this in 2015 and <clears throat> what happened was I was supposed to make this little short uh, for Pompeii and um, and I said, okay, let's make it, it's beautiful. I'm from Naples, for me it was like a great opportunity to work on, uh, on this Pompeii uh, site. And uh, so whatever, I went there and I realized that Pompeii is very interesting as a concept because the idea that it was a covered city, but in the end, it's just a huge ruined city. I know it sounds, um, prosaic, 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 yes, prosaic. but it's like this. And so I said, what am I going to do here? You know, because you know, you're all broken walls and broken columns and broken, everything is broken down. <laughs> so there's nothing really to show. And so what I was, this dilemma, I said, uh, I was waiting for a couple that were watching, they were looking at um, um, a fresco. And while we were waiting to, those two person to to leave, we are like you know with the camera and saying I was like can I do what can I do? So I like the idea. Those two I were totally like uh, frozen couple. And I asked, listen, can I shoot while you're watching while you're looking at this fresco? But please don't breathe, just stay still like this. And I did it, and I like it very much. The effect it was very interesting to see those like two statues looking at a fresco with statues. So I thought it was interesting. So I liked the idea, and so we went to, you know, place it by places inside, and <laughs> any time I saw like, a, a, you know, something that I liked, there were some people from Germany, Americans, whatever, I said, please stop. Can you do just one shot, just one shot? And they loved it, they liked it. So they stayed there, they were very good. The worst ones were the Italians. Bye -bye. You know, because I please stay still. And then we start talking to each other. Say, no, say, still, don't breathe. 
Don't even blink your eyes, yeah, just still. And um, so by all the other countries, people from other countries, they were perfect, I have to say. And also the, the funny anecdotes that happen, I need to have like a bigger group of people. And they told me, come then tomorrow morning, because all the ships are coming to Naples. They're going to bring like thousands and thousands of people here with group, like 80 people for each group. But you have to very quick, because they're going to come one after another. It's going to be a mess. And they went all through um, a theater that I wanted to, sh to, to, sh to shoot. So what happened? And I saw from far away, there was you know the guy with the umbrella. He looked uh, very stiff. Uh, he said, listen, I think this guy will never work with us. You know, I can ask this guy to stop 80 people here and do the shooting. I thought, it's going to be a nightmare. So I was already depressed, because after him, it would be impossible to do it, because it would come people and people. So I, said, well, I was like, uh, this guy came in with this group. And, and he said, hello, puppy. How are you? I said, what? I mean, in the end, this guy was someone that knew my some cousins or whatever. So thank God, because this guy, you know, I said, Please, listen, I, have need, I need to have this group of people to stop and make the scene. Could you help me? Could you tell them? So he made like a huge presentation, introduction. He told me, he's a great director from Italy, whatever. So those people are very, you know, impressed and pleased. So I put them in, in, you know, in, 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 on the set, and we did it just for one shot. And by what you know, it was was such a, a, a good luck. I mean, such a, a fortune to have this guy. And so I thought that that was a sign for me. I thought that could be a good idea because if that's happened, I mean, on thousands of people just to find this guy that knows me. So I thought it was um, it was a sign. And in fact, this little short was supposed to be on the um, Pompeii site, you know, website, but it was so, when it came out so beautifully, but not because I'm saying, because it was required from lots of, you know, festivals, and I even I won a, a prize in Los Angeles for this short. So, and um, so it was nice. Let's, let's watch it. Story. Yes. Well, listen, but do you understand me when I speak? Yes. yes. Okay. It's a New York case, puppy. No, because I think maybe I, 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 I eat a lots of words and uh, maybe, okay. I do. <laughs> I eat a lots of words. I'm fat, I'm fat. Okay. <laughs>
che bello papi, è proprio bellissimo, è really beautiful. I've seen it on, on the computer on the small screen and it's a completely different uh, impact uh, like this. It's it's really a beautiful piece. And, and and so this idea of the people standing still, it came to you by chance on the set while while you were already doing it. And it works perfectly with the stillness of the of the of the people in the cast that, that, and we associate Pompeii to that kind of immobility, right? Being frozen, yeah. like almost magically in, in one moment. Great, great idea. Randomly yeah. arrived, but beautiful. Yeah, most of the time when I'm working, the nicest idea, they come just at the moment. Sometimes forced to buy the fact that I don't know what to do. And uh, so... But, uh, Does it have to do with the fact that you're from Naples? L'improvvisazione? Could be. Could be. Could be, but also I think it's a matter of being under a pressure a little bit, because I was I was supposed to shoot in three days, and that was the second day I didn't know what to do with Pompeii, and uh, so and, and so I was I, I was struggling, and all of a sudden I saw that image of those two, that couple, you saw the lady with the hat and the guy with the, and I liked it. So something that just came, you know, out of yes. Yes. Yeah, no, because they just made it to show the scusts. When was this? Uh, 2015. It stayed for uh, like uh, seven months. Uh, we, I shot in an August, and the end of September, they took it away. They took it away, and they put all those casts in, in other places. In other places. Yeah. But, yes. In the last shot, when you were moving away, yes. were you kind of legal? No, 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 it was a little drone. You know, everybody is, but our drone was like a giocattolo, it was like a, a, toy. a toy, kind of, it was not as huge, super, <laughs> no, I think it was like this. And and, uh, was a glider, no, 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 it was a drone, it was a, just a little machine, that, you know. Like a joystick, you maneuver yeah. it in. Yeah. And, okay. yes, ma'am. Yes. And I'm wondering how much you have prepared for that particular... Uh, now, you know what happened? That I firmly asked the people at Pompeii said, I don't want to shoot with people. So all this, all this emptiness that you said, it was because I asked to shoot. And they said, okay, come at 7 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so we did. And so that's why we... We, we catch the, the sunset and the stuff. But then, as I say, all this emptiness was kind of like, so okay, okay, I changed my mind. Let's, let's shoot when there are people. <laughs> and uh, so that's, the fact that the, the atmosphere in the movie is always between uh, a sunset, you see, it's always like it's not bright light, except when if there are people, otherwise, it's always between, because I asked to shoot when there were no people, so the only time was the, you know. Like the yes, yes. Also. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Also, I think it gives kind of like um, epic, no epic, it reminds you like what we could be in this time, that sun, oh, no, no, it reminds me something the very ancient, yes, the, those two scenes. With the Not sound. only measuring with time, but also yeah. being considered a divinity in and of itself. And yeah. One of the most important ones. So the fact that it's blinking and winking yes. and it inter, uh, enters into this relationship with the director, but also with the viewer. Yeah. And Papi, before we say something about your, your feature films, um, I have one more thing, one more uh, little clip that I want to show. And it's from a series that you did for Corriere della Sera. Yes. L'Italia che non ti aspetti. And I thought that the idea was so brilliant because, you know, we Italians normally have the tendency to complain about ourselves, about our country, about our politicians, about our leadership. And uh, in this short series, there are four? four six. Six um, short films that you can find on the website of Corriere della Sera and also on Papi's website, um, in which Papi tells stories, unexpected, uh, of people that, given the crisis, and the situation in Italy 
came up with brilliant ideas and started to do something original, new, that was not expected, that you would not foresee. There is one, for example, that is um, in Venice that specializes in building oars for the gondole. Nobody does it anymore, and he had a degree, but could do, do nothing with it. So why not becoming a Rimarolo? Is the yeah, I don't know how to say that to um, the name, tell you the truth. And but we are going to see another one. It's only five minutes. It's in Italian, but the images are so eloquent that you're not going to need any translation. And I think these are six beautiful stories yeah. that you know bring hope and make us yeah. smile and make us yeah. think that some of the genius that through the centuries graced our country is still somehow there. No, but also the idea was that during the, the, the crisis, everybody were you know, depressed and, and to, to show us, you know, in general, to show people that if you have like something, even like a hobby could become your job if you like it. So maybe with something very little, you know, those people, with really nothing, they make lots of money, and ju just they they got fired from the work. They were like journalists or other, you know, and they they like they said they have like an hobby, and they made this hobby to become a work, and they make lots of money too. So the idea was to convert what is a crisis and make it in a positive moment of your life, and maybe look at yourself, look what you really like to do and put it in, uh, in work, you know, and make it uh, it's a, it's a, it's a work. Let's see the, um, the clip. Qui c'è con me Ilaria e Matteo e siamo i tre designer di Super Duper Hats. Io ho studiato architettura, Veronica e Matteo hanno studiato design. La nostra storia inizia nel 2010. Nessuno di noi pensava di aprire un'attività o di iniziare a fare i cappelli per, per professione. Questa passione è nata per gioco. Ce li eravamo sempre regalati tra di noi i cappelli, però non, non sapevamo come venissero fatti. L'idea di iniziare a fare i cappelli è nata anche dal fortuito incontro di questa nostra prima forma di legno, che una volta si usavano per fare i cappelli. Un giorno tra le diverse cose che abbiamo trovato ci siamo imbattuti in questo libro. Poi abbiamo scoperto che l'autrice era una vecchia modista fiorentina, Anna Maria Nicolini, quindi ci è venuto in mente di andarla a cercare. Siamo andati a prenderla, è venuta da noi e ci ha visto lavorare e ci ha dato i suoi primi consigli e ci ha fatto anche molti preziosi regali. Mandammo le foto dei nostri primi cappelli a Pitti Immagine per l'accettazione, a loro sono piaciuti. Di lì in un mese veramente siamo dovuti diventare un'azienda, quindi con un capitale sociale di 3.000 euro, 1.000 euro a testa abbiamo aperto la società e siamo partiti totalmente allo sbaraglio. Il feltro per cappelli non nasce come materia piana, quindi ha una forma già a campana che favorisce appunto la formatura. Questa parte della, della lavorazione è molto importante anche perché è quella in cui si decide la taglia e l'incapatura, si chiama, del cappello, ovvero eh, la forma, l'ovalità che ha il cappello. Questa è una macchina del 1800, è una macchina per cucire i cappelli. L'ultima parte di rifinitura del cappello, quindi il fiocco, che noi sia per quanto riguarda i pezzi unici che facciamo qui in laboratorio, sia per quanto riguarda le produzioni, applichiamo totalmente a mano come la tradizione vuole. 
quello su cui noi abbiamo sempre puntato e allo stesso tempo rendere il cappello un qualcosa che fosse assolutamente contemporaneo di design però eh, mantenere assolutamente la qualità sia dei materi, delle materie prime che la qualità produttiva di una volta quindi è stato difficile eh, diciamo, mettere insieme queste due realtà Iniziare a fare un progetto per una propria passione sicuramente senza pensare subito al guadagno imminente eh, sicuramente questa è una cosa che a noi ci è successa e, e forse è stata una delle nostre diciamo carte vincenti. Partire appunto anche dall'idea che eh, non è vero che è stato tutto fatto eh, ma che si può sempre migliorare e trovare sempre qualcosa per andare a fare un passettino in avanti. E questi uh, written, directed and produced by you, uh, Papi. Questi, qua, questi serie sei, right? Six. And these were stories that you knew already or you did research in order to find them? And Papi, now we have to talk about your feature films. Okay. Because it's interesting that as the director you started right away with feature films. Normally directors do when they're younger, a little short, and then a documentary, and then finally arrive at the feature. And y your career went sort of the other way around. Yeah, no, well, not really, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I would like to make another movie. Of so course. Yeah. But, um, so your first uh, film was Libera, correct? Yes. And um, I Bucchi Neri is well, your second, second film. And, um, in between the two, you were on the set with uh, Pedro Modova? No, before. Before, even before. before Libera? Yeah, I was 89. Tell us something about that, because then there was the myth that you were the Italian Almodova, that you're not. Uh -huh. But you were, a f as a matter of fact, assistant director to Pedro yeah. Modova for Atame, right? Yes. Time me up, time me down. No, I, what happened was I was here in the 80s, studied dance at Alvin LA School, doing adult acting and stuff. And but my idea, since I was a kid, it was to make a movie, but I thought it was too complicated to make a movie. So uh, what happened when I was here, I, w I, w you know, I went to see movies, of course. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think at the Quad, or another cinema similar to Quad, they were playing um, the, La the Law of Desire by Pedro Almodovar. And when I saw that movie, there was like a contemporary director, I felt, you know, when you see something that you connect, I said, that's something that really represented what I would do if I would make a movie. And um, so then I, like, I got courage and say, maybe I, my, idea, my, be, my idea of making a, a story to make a movie is this, so maybe it's, it's not so outrageous. So and I, I had a little courage and to start, and so I went to Went to Rome, it was Pedro Almodovar was in Rome having a prize. So I stopped him and asked if I could go like a voluntary assistant. And he said yes, I don't know why. But uh, I went there and uh, we became friends also. I didn't really work, I just saw him directing, <laughs> which is much better. And also I saw you know, what, it, you know, what it means to be on the set, and, but I didn't work though. And was that your only experience on the set with another director? Or you also did it with other? I did another one. Also, the, that was even worse because I didn't work, but I, didn't, I was really on the set. I was just hanging around. I was with a Napolitan director. He just made the one movie. He was famous to be a, a screenwriter. And, uh, but it was something that I did uh, just because it was in Naples. It was easy to... But I don't have like... A, a straight, you know, memorable uh, memories of this. And, and, and the experience on the set with Amudova? That was beautiful. It was also surprising, also because the way he shot things, the way he direct actors, it's very impressive and it's not a regular kind of, sh you know, 
casual, but it's very precise and very beautiful. The set was great. I mean, lots of surprising scenes, and so it was nice. Very good. Do we have any question for uh, Papi Corsicatos about I'm the sorry film if I'm getting that we saw this lower evening? And lower no, because we're going to let you go. You're have, tired, and you deserve to. No, because I have a jet lag. I did already. It's a, I was like, a, a you have already the done the Q&A before. Q &A. <laughs> if there, there is any question from our audience, yes. No, no. Well, I, I was quite good. Concern. I mean, what do you say? Um, according to my teacher, because I was, uh, how do you say, a donkey, a chucha. Uh. I didn't like to study at all when I was a kid. I hated it totally. So and uh, and so and the only thing that was easier for me to decide, you know, to to draw. So I, that's why I was the best in class because <laughs> it came very easily. I wasn't paying too much attention. So and um, so it was something that came very easily. And uh, also, I have to say that my father used to draw, he was just paint in the house. Uh, he's not a, was not a painter, but he, he was very much into. Um, he loved movies. He loved um, uh, paintings and sculptures, art in general. So at my house, I could find books, and even though just for fun, I would see those and uh, so I don't know if it made any sense but uh, was something that I wasn't totally um, it was just come dire. It was not foreign to you you were yeah. familiar even if yes. you didn't yeah. study formally art yeah yes. very good I think we should let Papi go and have a <laughs> great <laughs> aperitivo if I, I was <laughs> eating my <laughs> my words now <laughs> no, go have a drink enjoy New York Yes. I'm sorry? You believe in flying saucers. Uh, what do you mean for that? Nei, nei piatti volanti, nei ah, sure. volanti. Okay. And do. yes. <laughs> thank you. So much. No, thank you. Thank you very much for staying here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Grazie, Papi.